Good morning, church. Good morning, those of you out in the atrium making your way in. Welcome. My name is Justin Curtis. I get the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Coram Deo, and I'll be leading us through the liturgy while Micah and the band lead us in worship. The accumulation of wealth, the accumulation of experiences, perhaps success or good performance at work or relationships, we all, if you're anything like me, we all have this tendency to try to find our worth, our life, our meaning in the things of this world. It is a redemptive act for God Almighty to call us to worship Him, Whereas, where our ultimate hope is to be found where our ultimate satisfaction and joy and life is to be found in him. So God calls us to worship as we gather. Uh, and that movement of God towards his people, calling, calling the people to worship him is a redemptive and good act. So would you stand with me now and hear the word of the Lord from the prophet Isaiah calling us to worship him. I am the Lord, that is my name. I give my glory to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Now would you join me as we pray this truth aloud together. The gods of the nations are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Amen. Let's worship him. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near.
petition to the Holy Spirit that thy ceaseless renovation would it cleanse our souls from the stains of earth. It's part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to continue to be renovating our hearts. And one of the means by which that happens is the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin and leads us into this ongoing habit and practice of repentance and faith. So we're gonna model that now. We're gonna do that together as we just confess our sin before the Lord together and then hear his good news of the gospel spoken over us. So join me now as we confess our sin using the words on the screen. Creator God, we confess today our tendency to chase after idols. We have sought life, meaning, and joy in created things rather than in the Creator. We have turned your gifts into God's and loved them more than you. Forgive us, redeem us, and cause us to worship only you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear now God's word of pardon and peace to his people from Ezekiel chapter 36. Here the prophet says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and put a right spirit within you. To all who hope in Jesus Christ this morning, I declare to you, your sins have been forgiven. This is the good news of the gospel. Rest in it and be at peace.
our vision matters. What we, what we live for, what we see as the ultimate end matters. I had the privilege and opportunity yesterday to speak to about 100 elementary, middle school, little baseball players and, and, and shared the gospel with them. And part of that was just to remind them that they live and can live for, for more than just success individually or as a team on the baseball field, right? And, and we need to be reminded of the same thing as well, right? That, that we are living for, as God's people, something far greater than the accumulation of things here in the temporal world or even possessions or positions or success, but that, that our ultimate end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And that's gonna be at the heart of our profession of faith this morning. So would you join me now as we profess our faith using the words on the screen? We profess and affirm that God, our creator, has all life, glory, and goodness in and of himself. From him and through him and to him are all things. He is humanity's highest good. He alone is the source of all true joy and delight. And so we profess that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Amen. Well, I want to release those who now need to go off to the catechism class. So fourth and fifth graders who are in the room, Travis Barrett, Tracy Curtis, Grace Thune are out there ready to welcome you back into the catechism class. It's a big week. Uh, this is the last catechism class for these fifth graders before they roll into student ministry. And there'll be some third graders transitioning into fourth grade at the beginning of next month. So let's just say there might be some donuts for them back there, which <laughs> changes the game at that age. Trust me. Um, would you now take a moment and just greet one another in the name of Christ this morning? All right, that's enough, you guys. <laughs> hey, again, if you're newer here, my name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, I want to take a little bit of time now to remind, uh, remind us of what it is that we're doing here. Uh, Christian worship is countercultural. Every week when we gather here, we are, in a way, resisting the narratives that our culture urges us to live by. And one of those narratives is consumerism. We live in a consumeristic society uh, where we are always being told that more is better and newer is better, that having, possessing, and consuming will make us happy. And that's a compelling script. There are ways that life seems better because of the access we have to all kinds of goods and services. I personally tend to be more of a minimalist. I really don't like things, but this last week was Amazon Prime Day. And even I felt this urge to maybe I need to go check to see if I need anything. Um, we all feel this pull. It's part of the cultural waters that we swim in. But Christian worship invites us to consider a different way of living, a way of sacrifice, giving, serving, See, we worship a savior who did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life away. And every week as we remember his sacrifice for us, we are training our souls to reject consumerism and to embrace servanthood. And that's one of the things that we really wanna make as just a normal practice of our church is that we would be a people who embrace servanthood, who embrace sacrifice. And I do wanna, with that in mind, just communicate that we as a church have never been and never desired to be the type of church where 20% of the people do 80% of the work. 
Rather, we are kind of like an all hands on deck community to where we're all giving time and energy. So if you are newer to our church and you are looking for a way to serve, uh, I want to invite you to a particular need that we have right now. And this, this actually goes out to everybody. Um, we are, as we're transitioning into the school year, in need of about 30, 35 new volunteers for Cormdale Kids Ministry, which is serving one service one Sunday morning per month. We try to keep the bar of entry pretty low so that we can include a lot of people. Um, so we're needing some, uh, some people to serve in that particular ministry. Also, uh, we're kind of in need of some young men uh, to serve in uh, our student ministry, uh, ministering to middle schoolers and high schoolers. So I wanna unashamedly invite you to serve in one of those areas if you're not doing so right now. And just by way of, hey, let's all get on the same page. N no one really has the spiritual gift of toddlers. <laughs> it's okay to acknowledge that, right? None of us wake up and are thinking, man, you know what I wanna do today? I wanna hang out with some sixth, sixth grade boys. Like, no, but, <laughs> but what an opportunity we have. What an opportunity we have as a church to invest some of our best energy and time and resources to raise up the next generation of disciples and leaders who are gonna be a part of carrying this church into the future. Uh, I've, our, our kids, we have got some amazing kids, children and students who are a part of this church. And they just soak up so much of what we give and what we offer. So here's what I can almost guarantee you, your time and your energy will not be in vain. It's meaningful and it matters. So if you're not serving in one of those areas, I wanna invite you to, and hey, if you've been serving in one of those areas and you're kinda of like, man, this is getting a little routine, can I just invite you to snap out of that? <laughs> to say, as we're rolling into this next school year, like some of our best energy really needs to go to these areas. Because, I mean, we're talking, about, we're talking about meaningful discipleship. All right, okay, that's my, that's my rant. So obviously, um, for us to be a church that are connecting people to serve, we, we actually need to use some tools to be able to do that. So I wanna share some tools, some ways that you can get connected to our church or connected to serving if you're not doing so right now. One, there's a weekly email that we send out every Monday morning. If you're not signed up to receive that, uh, please do so by going to the front, of, front page of our website. Sign up for that email. If it goes into your junk mail, check that, get it out, put it into your regular uh, inbox. And if you're the type of person who at times maybe neglects it every, every now and again, um, pay attention to that weekly email, all right? There will be some tangible ways that you can respond tomorrow to serve here in our church. Uh, another way to get connected to serving, love for you to reach out to somebody on one of our, on our connections team. You can email connect at cdomaha.com. Uh, we got some people who would love to help you get connected to our church and get connected and involved in meaningful ways. Another tool that's available is we have our connection desk that's out there and you'll have some leaders there wearing green name tags who would love to help answer questions you have, get you the information that you need. So if you're looking to sign up or just wanna be put on a list to, to serve this this morning, you can go reach out and talk, talk with one of them as well. Um, one note, uh, we don't take an offering during our service here at Cormdale. Rather, on your way out to the left, you'll see a tithes and offering box. And uh, we just trust that if you're a Christian and this is your church home, that you're giving generously and sacrificially and joyfully to the work and to the ministry of the local church. Uh, additionally, we will have some leaders available up here after the service uh, who would love nothing more than to pray with you, uh, to pray for you, to come alongside you in prayer. So if there's things that you're celebrating, if there's things that you're struggling through, uh, we, we want to continue our ministry after the service is done by praying for and with one another. So please take advantage of that opportunity. Um, one of the things that God our Father invites us to as his sons and daughters is to pray. Uh, so I wanna transition us now into a time of prayer. And part of that prayer is gonna be praying for Pastor Valentine of Omni Fellowship Church in Cedar Hill, Texas. Um, there's a few things that we're gonna be celebrating this morning that, that he's just inviting us and the brothers and sisters that we have there as part of that church are inviting us to join them in praising God for. And then they also have some specific needs. Uh, so would you join me as we turn our attention to prayer, pray for Omni Fellowship, and then we'll close our time by praying the Lord's Prayer together. So would you join me now as we pray? God, our Father, we begin this week profoundly grateful for your relentless, never-ceasing work in our lives. 
Uh, you never sleep, you never slumber. You give us freedom in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. You free us from the bondage of sin. You free us from the love of self. You free us from the powers of this world. And by your spirit, would you now empower us to walk in truth, in love, and in grace? Would you continue to set us free from the fear of man as we believe and live in light of the gospel? Continue to free us from doing anything for the approval of people, out of fear of people, or to gain power or influence over people. Help us to live and to work for you, Lord Jesus, not for mere men. And empower us to live lives worthy of the gospel. Lives where, we, where we're free to love people without manipulation, where we're free to do our jobs without self-congratulation, uh, where we're free to serve those around us without unrealistic expectations. I do pray that you would provoke people even this morning to serve in, in meaningful ways in our kids' ministry and in our student ministry, that people would feel moved by you, Holy Spirit, to, um, to give some of their best to the next generation. We serve because you first served us. We love because you first loved us. You are the ultimate source of our true joy and delight. We pray for Omni Fellowship. We praise God for the increased number of attendees in that community that's leading them to prayerfully consider moving to two services. We praise God, you, for the faithful men that you've been gathering together regularly, meeting for Bible study. And we pray that those times together would um, provoke uh, men, give them ambition, that you, would, that you would call two or three of those men to serve as elders within the church, that you would continue to raise up leaders in that community. And we do pray uh, with the people of Omni Fellowship that they would be able to raise enough money to buy the property uh, next to them. We thank you for the, the people who, are, who have been growing there, and now we pray that you would, you would be generous by providing the needs that they have to minister to these new opportunities and, and things as tangible and practical as a, as a facility. Would you be abundantly generous to them? And we thank you for the ways that you've been generous to us. And now as your church, we pray together the prayer that you, Jesus, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture is Psalm 49. Hear this, all people. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both, ho and, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast in the abundance of their riches? Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. For he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, though they called lands by their own names. Man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence, yet after them, people approve of their boasts. Like sheep, they're appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. But God 
will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases, for when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed, and though you get praised when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers, who will never again see light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. The word of God for the people of God. Well, good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see uh, all of you this morning. Uh, summertime. It's one of my favorite times of the year, especially uh, growing up in northwest Washington. One of my favorite things that we would do as a family is not uh, fairly often. We'd go down to Seattle. We were about two hours north of Seattle and go down to watch the Seattle Mariners. I'm a diehard Mariners fan for better or for worse. And so we're just stuck in perpetual mediocrity as a Mariner fan, kind of like Nebraska. So we have that. <laughs> We have that in common. Um, but as, as a diehard Mariner fan, one of the fun things to do is in the summertime is go down to, at the time it was called Safeco Field, and just watch a Mariner game in person. And it's amazing because the sun's out, it's low 70s, you're kind of by the ocean, you see the Cascade Mountains off in the distance, and there's really nothing better as far as an environment to see a live baseball game. And maybe you kind of caught this this past week, because if you're a baseball fan at all, the All-Star Game was actually held in Seattle, the All-Star Game in the Home Run Derby. And it was a beautiful you know, time, the scenery, all that was great. What most people, though, don't realize is that that kind of scenery of the sun, open roof, all that, that's actually pretty rare in Seattle. Most of the time growing up, when we'd go down to Seattle to watch a baseball game, is that Safeco Field has this, it's kind of like something out of Star Wars, this like slow, retractable roof that just ominously like crawls over you because it rains so much in Seattle. And it's great because you can still go to a baseball game. There's never a rain delay. And what happens is that you're in, you know, the middle of the baseball game and, you know, a few hours go by and you completely forget what life is like outside of the stadium. I mean, the roof covers you, protects you from the rain, and you have no awareness of what's going on. The reason I tell you that is because the philosopher Charles Taylor uses a very similar analogy to depict two ways of being or living in the world. One way he calls the imminent frame, where essentially it's like living in sort of a stadium with a closed roof over your head with no sense of what's happening around it. in particular, no sense of the transcendent. No sense that there is a God who loves and cares for his people, a love who loves and cares for this world. This closed roof mentality he calls the imminent frame. And then there's this other way of being that's this open roof that's aware and recognizes and in receives the fact that there is a God who calls us to live a certain way, who calls us to live life that is truly life. And that's why, friends, I think we really need to pay attention to what Psalm 49 has to say to us this morning. Because Psalm 49 is going to essentially compare and contrast two ways of living. One way of living that essentially just kind of crams all meaning and significance into the here and now. Through abundance, through possessions, through wealth, through status. It's that closed roof, imminent frame mentality. And on the other hand, there's a way of being that doesn't necessarily reject wealth and possessions. They're not necessarily evil, but is more open to the things of God and recognizes there's life that is truly life that's more than just the here and now. So if you're new with us today, we've been going through the Psalms. Every summer we do this. We take, you know, a month or two or three to kind of work through the Psalms, picking up where we left off from the previous year. And today, again, we find ourselves in Psalm 49. But before we kind of dive into Psalm 49, I want to catch us up very briefly to where we've been, because actually, it's really important to understand the Psalms that come before to help us understand what Psalm 49 is saying. See, if you notice in your Bible, at the top, before verse 1, there's a little heading that says that this Psalm was written by or ascribed to the sons of Korah. 
Now, if you kind of keep flipping back, all of the psalms that we've looked at so far this summer have all been psalms from the sons of Korah. And this gets at to this really important thing because sometimes we think of the book of Psalms as sort of just this random collection of songs, poems, praise, hymns, whatnot, and whatnot that are kind of just randomly put together. The biblical scholar John Salehammer would often say that structure determines meaning. And what he meant by that is that often the structure of a book or the structure of a passage, or in this particular case, the structure of a certain section of a book, helps determine the meaning of what we're studying, or in this case, looking at this morning. And so thinking about what's come before, back to Psalm 43, starts with this individual lament, this plea, this cry for God to send light and truth. And that individual lament grows to this collective corporate lament in 44, awake, O Lord, arouse yourself, come to our aid, why do you sleep? And these laments enter, if you will, into the presence of God and, and realize that God is this king, Psalm 45, who's full of love and authority. And Psalm 46 kind of goes even further to say God is this fortress, this stronghold. Be still, my soul, Psalm 46. And then from there, as we kind of continue on with the sons of Korah, 47 just orients our praise and our attention to God being king over all the universe. And last week, Travis Barrett did a phenomenal job showing us how Psalm 48 reminds us of the hope that we have in who God is and that new heavenly city, that new Jerusalem. So that orientation of taking us from lament and sorrow to praise and to our focus on who God is and what he's done and the hope that we have in him leads us then to Psalm 49. Because Psalm 49 is a bit different. Psalm 49 is essentially the risk. In light of everything that's happened before, Psalm 49 is an invitation to respond to the God who is king over all the earth, to the God who is full of love and authority, to the God who is a mighty fortress. How then are we to live in this world in light of what's come before? That's the, essentially the question before us. Or to put it another way, here's the question that I want us to ponder as we look at Psalm 49. Whose version of the good life are you trusting? There's a version of the good life that essentially closes off all reality of the transcendent and just tries to cram all meaning and significance into the here and now. And there's a version of the good life that responds to the goodness of God and is open to the things of God and finds meaning and significance in him. James K.A. Smith kind of summarizes this idea when he says this, it's precisely when your ultimate conviction is that there is no eternal that you're most prone to absolutize the temporal. And this is kind of the task before us this morning to look at Psalm 49. I just want to take us through it kind of line by line and unpack this idea and ask this question, whose version of the good life are you trusting? So verse 1, Psalm 49 says this, Hear this, all peoples. Give ear to all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. Notice verses 1 and 2 kind of orient us to who the audience is of this psalm. This psalm is not just for the people of God. Notice the audience is for all peoples, rich and poor, low and high. So for you in this room, whether you're a Christian or not, the wisdom that this psalm has on offer is an invitation to every single person here this morning. Whose version of the good life, then, are you trusting? And notice again that this is a wisdom psalm. It's like in response to all that we've read and sung before, if you're looking at the psalms, the sons of Korah, how then are we to live? What's the wisdom that's on offer here? Verse 4, I will incline my ear to a proverb, I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. I love verse 4 for this reason because it reminds us that while we're not going to sing the psalm, this psalm this morning, that originally this was, by indication of verse 4, meant to be sung. And that there's this element, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you're kind of stuck or in a rut or experiencing a difficult time and just have questions or whatever the case might be, that how helpful it is in those moments 
to turn your attention back to the Lord, specifically through song and through worship. And that does something to us. That can free us from the tyranny of whatever that, that issue or that problem might be, or at least can help us in that regard. I'm reminded of what Sam Storms talks about in his book on spiritual warfare, about how, how important it is to worship, especially through song, how that can free us from just the tyranny of whatever might be holding us back in the here, in the here and now. He specifically talks about that story in Samuel where David would play his musical instruments in the presence of Saul. And when David would play, when David would sing, when David would worship, that would free Saul from that evil spirit. And I can't help but wonder for us this morning that whether, whatever difficulty we might be, be facing, how important it is to continually come before the, law, before the Lord specifically through songs of worship, to set us free from the bondage that often easily ensnares us of having to cram all meaning and significance into just the here and now. That subtle grip, that subtle temptation that easily can overcome us where we just want to have all purpose and validation and everything, close the roof off to God and say, this is it. How might worship free us from that this morning? Verse 5 continues, though, why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches? Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. And he should live on forever and never see the pit. See, the, the sons of Korah, the psalmist of Psalm 49, is inviting us to live this life that doesn't succumb to the fear of just always wanting to have more, of always wanting to live life where it's just gaining more possessions, gaining more abundance, gaining more whatever the case might be. That there's a futility in that way of living, Psalm 49 reminds us. And it's, to be clear, it's not to say that abundance or possessions or wealth or affluence is bad in and of itself. It's not to say that if you have been blessed or gifted any sort of way with financial resources, that is evil and sinful. No, that's not what this psalm is saying. This psalm is saying that when we allow those things to be the controlling kind of force or feature of our lives, when we place all meaning and significance into the here and now with what we have, that's creates this snare and this trap that closes us off to the purposes of God and who, what God wants for us. Remember what Jesus said that essentially one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. That there's actually more to live for. There's a way to live. There's a, the actual good life that does not close oneself off from God but is actually free from the grip of those things, even if they might be good. That's why I love what Tim Keller says about this psalm. He says this, Only God can give you things of value that death cannot touch but only enhance. But there's something more to live for. But take a look at verse 10. For he sees that even the wise die. The fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever. Their dwelling places to all generations, though they called lands by their own names. Isn't that kind of a haunting line at the end of verse 11? Though they had all of the prestige and the fame in this life, that's all they were living for. Verse 12, man in his pomp. Go ahead and underline that if that's, if you kind of like to underline, we're going to talk about that. Man in his pomp will not remain he is like the beast that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence. Yet after them, people approve of their boasts. And if you notice in your Bible, you probably have a little word at the end of verse 13, Selah. It's a word that maybe most of you are familiar with that simply means something to the effect of slow down or pause or take a break. It's a way to remind 
us as readers that we shouldn't just sort of speed read through something like this. That we should take time to reflect and meditate and ponder what exactly is Psalm 49 and up until this point, this section, inviting us to consider, inviting us to meditate on. And that's what I want to do is actually just kind of slow down here. And let's talk about some of these verses, in particular this idea in verse 12, man in his pomp is like the beasts that perish. If you skim down to the very end of this psalm, verse 20, it's almost verbatim, the same line appears again. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beast that perish. What is this idea of pomp? It's a word that's not completely foreign, but it's not a word that I at least use on an everyday basis. Pomp is a word, at least in the, the scriptural narrative, a word that can be translated as honor or prestige or even vanity. It's a word that kind of communicates the tendency that we have as humans to put up a facade and to allow our lives to be determined by the external and the here and now. Again, that pressure to live life in that imminent frame, the closed roof, where all my significance and all my worth is placed in the here and now. That, that's pomp. Pomp is this way of living that says the most important thing is what that person thinks about me. Pomp is a way of living that cares more about my external appearance, how I look, and spends all this time caring about that and not so much time in prayer before the Lord. Pomp is living a life that exudes all of this confidence, yet in reality lays awake at night full of worry and anxiety because you wonder, where is my actual worth found? Pomp is chasing circumstance and experience after experience to furnish the empty room of our own souls. See, pomp is a way of living within that imminent frame, a closed roof sort of reality that is not open to the life that is truly life, the actual good life, that is actually set free for living a life that does have meaning and significance because God is at the center. I was reminded this past week of a, a little book called, well, the subtitle is what always gets me, Leaving the Emptiness of False Attractions. And in this little book, the author talks what he calls the 10 empty Ps. And it really, I think, connects to what this psalm is talking about. 10 empty Ps. It's kind of cheesy. It's way too long of a sermon outline, so don't worry, I'm not going to preach through all 10 right now. But I actually find it incredibly helpful. Here they are. Pleasure, I think they're on the screen behind me. Pleasure, praise, power, prestige, position, popularity, people, productivity, possessions, and perfection. Because we're talking about pomp as well, there's, there's 11 for you. What are, what are these? These are ways, apart from Christ as our foundation, these are ways of living life where all meaning and significance is just crammed into the here and now. These are ways, if we're honest, where this pompous way of living, where we're tempted to, to find meaning and significance in the external, in the present, in the temporal. These are ways that if we're not careful, they can easily become, I find in my own life, like if I'm not like in tune with the presence of God and continuing this mode of repentance and, and confession and, and, and faith, that it creates sort of this like subtle, yet also strong grip on my own soul. Where I'm no longer thinking and meditating and setting my mind on things above and just so focused then on the here and now. You know, how this looks in my life, let me just name something that's happening right now in this moment in this room for me. See, I'm up here, obviously, and there is a huge part of me that honestly wants to preach and to teach and to share God's word in a way that is motivated by self-giving love, where I want you to see the beauty of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. I want you to see the power of God's word and experience the power of God's spirit transforming you to become more and more conformed in the image of Jesus. And 
there's a part of me that wants you to think I'm doing a good job right now. There's a part of me that has some motivations that are rooted in performance or pleasure. What is that? That's a vain attempt to live the good life with this closed roof mentality, just cramming all meaning and significance into the here and now. That's a, to use the language of Psalm 49, a pompous way to live, a meaningless way to live. But friends, don't you see how Psalm 49 is ever so gently encouraging us and prodding us and even, may I say, challenging us to see that there's actually a better way to live in this life. There's a better version of the good life on off offer. Because what happens is if we allow these things to be the things of the here and now, to be what controls and what becomes the everyday worries and cares of this world, to be the animating thing that drives us, what this ends up doing is it has this side effect where we then begin to care about things that we should be caring about less and less. We begin to care about others less than we should. We begin to care about serving less than we should because we're caring about something else that ultimately will not satisfy. Very simple diagnostic question to kind of evaluate this that if I found helpful is simply asking this one particular question. How much do I care about the things I care about? How much do I care about the things I care about? And going before the Lord, going before the Spirit, and just inviting his voice to speak into that. To poke and to prod and to gently bring us to a place of recognition that, you know what, friends? There is something more to live for. There is something better to live for. One author says it like this. We've been consumed by things that feed the ego, but starve the soul. And that's why we need to hear Psalm 49 say to us, man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beast that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence, yet after them, people approve of their boasts. Tim and Kathy Keller in their devotional on this particular psalm say this, Lord, I often catch myself imagining how much greater life would be if I had more. I also quietly boast in my heart when I see myself able to afford cer certain goods and inhabit certain places. Save my heart from such shallowness and foolishness. The psalm goes on though, verse 15, but God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol for he will receive me. Selah. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed. And though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers who will never again see light. Man in his pomp, there's our phrase again, yet without understanding is like the beasts that perish. I want you to notice verse 16, the directive that the psalmist gives us, be not afraid. It's actually an echo back to verse 5. So twice within this psalm we have this phrase, man in his pomp is like the beast that perish. But also twice within this psalm we have this directive and this invitation to not fear or be not afraid. And I think this is really significant, another moment to ponder and slow down. Because let me ask you this, what is the scariest thing you've experienced in your life? What is the most, the thing that you're most afraid of? I can tell you one of the scariest moments in my life was a few years ago in the middle of the night, sleeping or trying to sleep. And I'm basically fully asleep, but I kind of, kind of in and out, and I'm hearing like someone's walking in our house in the middle of the night, one or two in the morning. And I'm just, you know, really tired, so I'm not, you know, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I'm just trying to sleep in that moment. 
And all of a sudden, I can kind of sense, you know, can you, you can kind of sense this sometimes when you're sleeping. I can sense that there's someone standing right next to me as I'm sleeping. And I open my eyes, and it's, it's my four-year-old son, Kaysen. <laughs> and it's at that, he, he's, so I'm, I'm laying down, and Kaysen's, you know, he's at that age where he's basically, his head is right at my head's level. And I was just completely terrified. And all Kaysen says back to me is, my blankies are all crumply. <laughs> and that was, and if you've ever been there in that moment, it is frightening <laughs> having someone just this shadowy figure, even though he's my cute son, right there. And I say that because that type of fear is something that goes away. It's like, oh, it's a funny moment now. It goes away. There's another type of fear, though, that kind of just resides and remains, and it's really hard for it to go away. I would submit to you that Psalm 49 is pointing us to that type of fear, the fear where we cram so much meaning and significance into the here and now that it leads us to this place of wondering, am I enough? Is this enough? Will I ever be good enough? And the psalmist is saying, do not fear. Don't go down that path. I have wisdom for you, the psalmist is saying, that there's actually a better way to live. And why can the psalmist say that? Why does the psalmist say that? Well, just look at one verse prior in verse 15. But God, but God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol. In those first two words of verse 15, I think, but God, two of the most important and gospel-filled words in all of Scripture. Because if we're honest, friends, it's so easy to just live life for the here and now, but God. It's so easy to see my worth and my identity and how much I have or how much I can accumulate and what I can perform, but God. It's so easy to seek affluence and prestige and recognition in just the here and now and to allow that to control my narrative and my being, but God. See, the psalmist is saying the invitation to the life that is truly life is because of this but God. And what is the psalmist highlighting specifically about God? That God has the power to ransom my life from the power of Sheol. You know, at the very beginning of this sermon, I mentioned that this psalm and the ones before it were written by the sons of Korah. Who are the sons of Korah? They're actually, Korah in particular, goes all the way back to number 16. And in number 16, Korah and a couple of his friends, kind of to summarize real quick, they have this rebellious moment against Moses. And essentially, at, in number 16, it's this gnarly story where essentially the ground opens up and eats Korah and his buddies. It's like that Sarlacc, Sarlacc monster in Star Wars, right? Just sucks them up. But in number 16, the text tells us that Korah succumbs to the power of Sheol. And I find it interesting that not just here in verse 15, but if you go back up one more verse in verse 14, Sheol is mentioned over and over and over again. And so generations later, the sons of Korah, I think, reflecting back on their own family history, recognize that the God that they serve has power over even Sheol. That the final word in their story is not just the here and now. The final word in their story is not the grave, is not death, but is in the God who has power over death. Because Sheol, friends, remember, is, is just simply a Hebrew word for the grave or the pit. 
And the psalmist here in Psalm 49, the sons of Korah recognize that their story, that their significance is not ultimately tied to their own family story. It's not ultimately tied to what happened in their past or what they did or did not do, but is ultimately defined by the transcendent God who does have power over the grave, has power over Sheol. And the psalmist here recognizes this. But how much more for us. Again, verse 15, but God will ransom, redeem, purchase, revive my life from the power of Sheol. Did not the Lord Jesus Christ say himself, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and what? Give his life as a ransom for many. See, friends, what can free us from the fear of just living a life that's so just stuck with the here and now, finding all significance and purpose and possessions and abundance and wealth and affluence and all those empty peas? What has the power to ultimately free us from that way of living, to free us to live the life that is truly life in the language of Jesus? May I submit to you, it's a recognition and a reception by faith, a trust in the fact that our God, who we should not close off but has entered into human history, died for our sins and has defeated the grave, has defeated death. And friends, when you remember this, when you reflect on this, when you trust in this gospel, in this good news, you know what this does for you? This frees you from having to live this life where you put all of this pressure on yourself and even on others to find significance and worth and value in what you have or what you don't have and who you are or who you're not and all of the things of the temple. It frees you to live more lightly with a less of a grip on the things of this world with a levity and a joy and a delight. Were you not closing yourself off from the God who is above and the God who is also near and present to you? But you recognize that God in the person of Jesus has defeated death. And the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is alive and at work in you, Christian, this morning. Inviting you, encouraging you, and even challenging you to say, whose version of the good life are you really trusting? Whose version of the good life are you really trusting? The good news of the gospel, friends, is that it frees us to live a different kind of life. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you. We thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for Psalm 49. And that how you speak so clearly and yet so gently to us. And Lord, I pray that as we continue to worship you through song, that you would, you would continue to do that work of renewal. Continue to do that work of just helping us to delight in the things of you. Where the things of this world would fade in comparison with the beauty and the goodness of who you are, Jesus. So, Spirit, would you please move in and through each of us. Move through me. Move through your people. Free us to live the life that is truly life. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And now... Let all sinners who are grieved and humbled by their sin, let all the weak who need their faith to be strengthened, and let all who love the triune God yet wish to love him more come now to the table of the Lord. The scriptures tell us that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus Christ took bread and he broke it and he said to his disciples, this is my body which is given for you. Likewise, he took a cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. 
drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. So we come to his table as an act of worship and obedience. And all who come to the Lord's table should come in humility and self-examination, for these are holy things for a holy people. Those among us who have not yet come to Jesus in faith and in baptism should not partake, but please feel free to either stay in your seat or come and pass by the elements and use this as a time of prayer and reflection. And if there are any here who are under the discipline of the church or who are living in hard-heartedness before God, we invite you to refrain as well. But let all who humbly hope in the Lord Jesus Christ be assured that your sin, your weakness should not keep you from this table. Christ welcomes his people to come and find strength and healing in him. We have communion tables at the front of each of these four sections. We'll invite you to exit out the left of your row, starting in the front, making our way to the back. And as you come forward, a server will place bread into your hands and speak a word of blessing over you. And you can grab either a cup of wine or juice from the table, and return back to your seat and partake. If you need a gluten-free option, we'll have that available in the back as well. And for those of you who are up in the balcony, you can make your way down into any section that works best for you. May you be strengthened now by the grace of God in Christ and come to the Lord's table as you're ready. Shame. 
beyond the measure that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Nothing of our efforts and all legacies survive unless the Lord does raise the house in vain. Its builders strive to you, those two miles gain. Tell me. God's people are a redeemed and sent people. So as you go out of here this morning uh, and you get outside and you lift your eyes to the sky this morning, as you do that throughout the week, would you be reminded that the gospel of Jesus Christ sets us free from having to find value and significance in the temporal, but we get to live in light of the eternal, glorifying God and enjoying him forever. If we can pray with you, come alongside you in prayer, a coal, tie, Jenna will all be up here, uh, would love to serve.
served and ministered to you in that way. Uh, but as you go now, receive this benediction. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit abide and remain in us now and throughout our time on earth until the day of his return. Amen. Go in peace.